as I said, we're going to sort of fly through a few things here today uh, because we do have about three chapters to cover. There are some main uh, points that I want to I want to hit for each of these. So we'll we'll hit the high spots. It doesn't mean you don't need to go back and take a look at this uh, a little bit deeper in a few places, but I'll try to point you in the right direction here. So first, let's have a little chat about schizophrenia and affective disorders, right? Uh, most of this we're just going to talk about schizophrenia. This is a, a pretty serious mental disorder. It seems to affect maybe 1% uh, of the population, right? So it's sort of a, a small group of folks. Uh, typically, you're going to see an onset in teens or young adulthood, right? So uh, anybody past the age of 30, you're probably in the, there you go, Zane, you're in the clear, don't have to worry about this now. Um, the only caveat to that, and sort of an interesting one actually, um, is if you're a female, so you, you're like, there's like, uh, you're probably, you know, you got to worry about it when you hit 30, you're okay. Uh, but then there's that other sort of later in life major event uh, that happens in women that adjust their hormones kind of in all kinds of different directions. There is a bit of an uptick in the likelihood that you'll develop schizophrenia um, after menopause. So if you're, if you're a female, uh, you guys will know if you are or not, right? Easy way to check. Um, you guys can figure it out. You might have to worry about that sort of later in life uptake. The reason for that is, is uh, there's some new evidence coming out, which is kind of cool, that maybe estrogen has a protective, um, sort of a protective feature for the development of schizophrenia, which would explain why men are more likely to develop schizophrenia than women, and then once you hit menopause and your estrogen levels drop, that there's that uptick in, um, in the likelihood that females would develop schizophrenia. So it's sort of an interesting uh, sort of approach. Um, I don't know that there are any sort of uh, therapeutic interventions working on that just yet. I'm sure some folks are thinking about it, but, um, but there you go. There's also, uh, just as a sort of added evidence to that, there is a, a relationship between the age of onset of puberty in females and the likelihood that they will develop schizophrenia. So if you uh, hit puberty sooner, you're less likely to become schizophrenic. Again, because your estrogen levels are going to be higher for a longer period of time, and if estrogen is protective against this particular disorder, then you would imagine that would make some sense, right? So it's kind of cool. So there you go. Great job, Casey. Uh, there are sort of three categories of symptoms with schizophrenia. We think about uh, positive symptoms, negative symptoms, and cognitive symptoms. Positive symptoms do not mean they are good. Right? It just means you've got something that you shouldn't have. Negative, uh, in this case, I mean, it is bad, but uh, in this case, it means you're missing something that you should have, right? And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, so for positive symptoms, we typically think about thought disorders, uh, delusions, right? There are different kinds of delusions that, uh, that folks will have. They're often uh, delusions of persecution. That's a pretty common one. Everybody's out to get you, right? Um, so watch out, you know, there are people, you know, just, just lurking around the corner ready to get you. Uh, people are monitoring you all the time. Uh, delusions of grandeur, right, those happen too. Uh, folks think there's somebody important, uh, you know, there's the sort of stereotypical, uh, you know, messiah sort of uh, delusion, right. And then uh, we also have hallucinations. If, um, if you have positive symptoms, you're thinking about hallucinations. Typically, this is going to be auditory, right? It's, it's not a whole lot of uh, visual. It's mostly you hear voices. Those voices might tell you to do things. Probably shouldn't do those things, right? I don't know how many people come into, like, the clinic and say, boy, I've got some voices, like, telling me to get up and brush my teeth and go to work and do a great job. Those, those don't happen, right? These are voices telling you to do things that you, you probably shouldn't do. Voices don't make a lot of sense. Or occasionally... They'll tell you to do something really awesome, um, but they're not really giving you any good advice to get there, right? Like, oh, man, you got to go out and save the world, right? And you're going to, like, feed all the hungry kids, and you're going to do this by blowing up balloons. I, I don't know, right? It's always, like, something that doesn't make sense, right? And uh, quite often you'll have these, like, you'll see folks that, like, take notes, they'll write down, like, oh, hey, look at this. This is my plan, and it's just kind of this jumbled mess of things, right? It's, it's kind of difficult to follow. So there you go. 
Um, there is some uh, genetic component, but it's not uh, it's not like Huntington's disease, which is if you get the gene, you've definitely got it, right? There are genes that make you more likely to develop schizophrenia. Uh, there, are, it's like a whole cluster of genes. Uh, folks are still kind of working on those. This is why identical twins do not always both develop schizophrenia, right? Now, there, now, if one develops schizophrenia, the other one's obviously more likely than the average population to develop schizophrenia, but there have to be some environmental ev um, events as well to kind of trigger you into to developing this. Uh, here's that nice chart we were just talking about with the uh, sort of age breakdown in males and females. Again, males are more likely in general to develop schizophrenia, right? And this is particularly true in that kind of late teen, early 20s sort of grouping. But again, Zane, once you get past 30, you're okay. If, you, if, you're, if you're a guy, you're fine. You get past 30 if you're a female, you still got to watch out for that little uptick there at the end. So don't want to make you anxious the rest of your life thinking you're going to develop schizophrenia, but just hang in there. All right, we already talked about positive uh, hallucinations, thought disorders, delusions. Uh, there's also delusions of control, right? Like maybe other people are controlling you, making you do things, right? Like, uh, didn't want to go eat that ice cream, but, you know, shooting these rays from space. I know that sounds hilarious to, like, people who aren't experiencing these sort of things, right, Sarah? I mean, it's like rays from space making you eat ice cream. But uh, to folks who are schizophrenic, I mean, this is a very... I, I, this is not a joke. Uh, they believe it, right? And so this is, uh, you know, when I was in graduate school, a friend of mine, his roommate was uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia. His roommate was convinced uh, that his other roommates, like like every night, they were coming in and kicking him in the back uh, while he was asleep because he woke up every morning and his back hurt. Uh, now, most of us, if we wake up in the morning and our back hurts, we, we, we look for other explanations, right? So maybe I need a new mattress. Maybe I shouldn't like sleep with my textbook under me. Uh, you know, there are like other things that we think about. Someone who is, you know, schizophrenic, and they're especially if they're experiencing these delusions of persecution. You know, they're going to run to some other explanation, perhaps, right? And so, he, his explanation was everyone was coming in and kicking him in the back in the middle of the night, which apparently didn't wake him up. I mean, he was apparently a very deep sleeper, right? Um, I don't know if any of you've ever been kicked in the back while you were asleep, but it's an easy way to. It's a good alarm clock. It'll wake you right up. Get you out of bed in a hurry. Uh, if we think about negative symptoms, lots of folks who have schizophrenia, they'll have a flat and emotional response, right? So flat affect. They don't, they don't talk much. They'll have poverty of speech. Uh, they don't really have a lot of drive, right? So they're not really going to get up. They're not going to be motivated to do things. Quite often, um, we see this sort of manifest itself in poor hygiene, right? So folks won't want to get up, they won't want to take a shower, they won't trim their fingernails, they won't do the things you know that, that most folks do every day, just as sort of a basic routine. Uh, they also experience something called anhedonia, right? So this is the lack of um, any kind of pleasure from, from normal activities, right? So if you guys normally you enjoy, before you're diagnosed, let's say before you have any symptoms, you really enjoy uh, riding your bicycle or uh, playing video games, whatever it is, right? After you start to experience symptoms, you're probably not going to get much enjoyment from those things, right? And, of course, all of that's going to add up to a bunch of social withdrawal, right? Zane, why would you want to go out in public if everybody there is out to get you? you got to watch out because when they stare at you, they'll make you do things you don't want to do. Um, you're not going to be talking to anybody. Everybody's going to look at you kind of strangely, right? You're not clean. You're not doing the normal things. You don't even have the initiative to really get up and go out. So a lot of social withdrawal. We think about cognitive symptoms, we're going to be thinking about difficulty with attention. Uh, low psychomotor speed, don't worry about that too much. Definitely going to have some deficits in learning and memory. Abstract thinking is going to be difficult, and so is your problem solving, right? And so this is one of the, sort of connects back to that thought disorder kind of business, right? So we're having trouble sort of following through, putting ideas together. Some of these symptoms, there, there's a little overlap, right? You know, you kind of see maybe you put them in more than one place. But this is sort of the typical breakdown. All right, we already talked about this. We don't need to spend a whole lot of time on it. You guys know about twins. Uh, what are some uh, 
issues that other than just what we think about for, for genetics or some other sort of uh, other than the genes what are other things that might happen one paternal age this is one of the times when the age of the father actually seems to have an impact right a lot of times we think about the mother especially when we think about down syndrome for example right uh, that's almost exclusively due to the age of the mother uh, that's typically the, the the main issue there did you talk about down syndrome? okay so uh, you know that's typically the issue there but the schizophrenia paternal age seems to make a, you know make an impact epigenetics I don't want to give you like a full epigenetic lecture although this is pretty cool business right so you've got your regular stranded DNA you've got your genes that's awesome things can happen to that right that twist it and turn it uh, and these, there are these like histones and other kind of things right that can open and close particular parts of your DNA that allow you to um, to read that and make proteins right and based on epigenetic impacts you can um, you can actually have some impact uh, generations away right did I tell you guys about the um, I don't know did we talk in here about the rats and the uh, the the high-fat diet rats who respond their brains responded like drug addicts it's kind of an interesting story um, but there have been a number of studies with rats and epigenetics not just that group another group has looked at um, a diet as well and they've seen that even two and three generations out uh, even when you're not passing down genes or behaviors the epigenetics sort of twists and turns uh, that that make it from you know make it downstream uh, have an impact so it's sort of an interesting way of, uh, of looking at things it's a relatively new uh, sort of concept too tons of other environmental factors a season of birth actually is, is kind of a, a fascinating one right so uh, folks who are born sort of in the uh, late winter and early spring seem to be more likely to uh, to develop schizophrenia now if you start to think about this some and you start to look back at like vitamin D deficiencies right uh, malnutrition some of these other things that can all sort of be connected and, and overlap, right? There was a big study a number of years ago um, in, uh, I don't remember the country, it was a Scandinavian country and they had a they had this uh, severe famine. What they found is, you know, folks who were born during or right after that famine, they were at, a, at an increased risk of developing mental health issues of just about all kinds, but in particular schizophrenia, right? And so they were dealing uh, with these sort of issues. So there you go. Uh, again, these are not. So just because you were born in February doesn't mean, you know, you're definitely right. So I don't know. Somebody smiled at that. Maybe your birthday's in February. Okay. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're definitely going to get schizophrenia, right? It just seems to be a slight increase in folks born late, uh, late spring, early winter. So or late winter, early spring. So there you go. Of course, if you've got all of these things kind of piled up together, and then on top of that, you've got those genes that are, uh, you know, making it more likely for you to develop schizophrenia, right? And let's say your father was, was I don't know, Larry King. Uh, <laughs> that was funny to four people. Uh, the rest of you look up Larry King later. Um, his last child was born when he was, what, 250 years old, something like that? <laughs> Is that true, Casey? Probably. Probably. Uh, you know, he's he, he's quite old, has a drastically younger wife, um, and and has two kids with her. So, um, I don't know. I think it's the suspenders. It has to be it. It has to be it. I need to the red ones. I'm going to switch to suspenders. I don't think my wife would appreciate that. <laughs> Maybe I'll just. We will try that with somebody else. Uh, all right, there are some brain things that uh, that are different, right? Obviously, if you're uh, if you're behaving differently globally like that, maybe there are some some changes. In particular, your your ventricles seem to be enlarged. You guys remember those fluid-filled spaces 
sort of in the middle of your brain. Uh, and you actually have a corresponding loss of gray matter. Now, gray matter are brain cells, right? Those are cell bodies. White matter is going to be the axons, but they seem to actually be losing some, um, some gray matter as well. On top of that, there are actually some uh, what we call minor physical anomalies associated with schizophrenia. Uh, Do you guys talk about fetal alcohol syndrome? Okay, so with fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, with Down syndrome, there are some rather pronounced, uh, what we call stereotypical sort of physical features, right? Uh, with schizophrenia, these are a little bit uh, less uh, likely, but uh, or less obvious, but uh, you can kind of notice these. So if you have two or more hair whirls, right? I know that's, that's fun. Everybody's thinking like, what's a hair whirl? Um, so it's kind of like the, you know, like the crown of your head where things kind of spin out. Uh, eyes, you have, there's some different uh, sort of folding with the eyes, your ears, low seated ears, and um, you know, some things you can look for uh, when you're trying to, to, to look to see. These are things that might be uh, predictive, right? These are things you could look for probably in a young child that uh, would not maybe be experiencing any symptoms yet, right? And so that would be maybe helpful in some sort of like, hey, let's get prepared for this. What can we do uh, to think about things, right? You, you always want to do that. So any of you have kids, you know, like start look, looking at their head whirls, hair whirls, seeing like, oh, how many do they have? Doesn't mean anything's going to definitely happen, but, you know, get you prepared for it, right? So you can think, well, hey, maybe there's some steps we can take to, to sort of mitigate any upcoming issues we might experience. What's a furrowed tongue? Yeah. Anybody know what a, fur what a furrow is? It's a long, narrow trench made in the ground by a plow. Obviously, you're not using a plow on your tongue, uh, but if you have a furrowed tongue, see something like that. Come on, Google, give me images. Yeah, you can kind of see that you have, uh, you'll have some long fissures in there. Yeah, those are just nasty looking. <laughs> Obviously, there are a number of reasons why you would have a uh, furrowed tongue. Uh, dehydration, obviously, being one of those. Like, don't go out and, you know, I know you're already worried, right? Because, like, February. And then you're like, after a race, you're going to run, and you're going to go, like, straight into the mirror, and you're going to look at your tongue, and it's going to, like, you know, look a little uh, dried up, and you're going to go, oh, no, problems now. So, and then you're going to have this whole conversation with yourself about whether or not you should shave your head to see how many hair whirls you have, because your hair is so long, it's going to flatten them out, right? Uh, so if you have longer hair, it's going to be a little more difficult to determine if you have a hair whirl. Uh, because the hair is going to pull it down. So if you have shorter hair, you, you kind of notice uh, more easily. So there you go. Keep that in mind. Also, with long hair, you don't know if your ears are low seated or not. So you got that problem. So just helping you out all around. Uh, the, the ventricle size, we already talked about that. Folks with schizophrenia seem to have larger ventricles. They seem to have um, everybody, hey, hold on for this. Everybody's going to lose some gray matter as you get older. It's already started. Look at this. I mean, this graph starts at 20, but you got to go back. I mean, this is like when you were 10. You're already losing gray matter now, right? Uh, and it's just going to keep happening the rest of your life. Right. No, make that happy face. Uh, you guys are excited about that. Um, if you have schizophrenia, you're going to lose that gray matter at a slightly faster rate. Uh, these are actually uh, identical twins. So this is kind of cool. These are identical twins. One was diagnosed with schizophrenia and one was not, right? Because the one who was not diagnosed was not having any symptoms, right? I mean, that's what, what's going on there. But you can definitely look at the ventricles. Here is the, uh, you know, um, I say healthy twin. I, I don't, it's not always the best word to use, I think, right? Because this guy might have been healthy too. I mean, he just had a little trouble there with his brain. So, but you can see the enlarged ventricles in that individual compared to his identical twin. So that's kind of cool, right? 
All right. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to ask you about specific drugs that are used to treat schizophrenia, right? So don't worry about that too much. We do want to think about, though, in general, what kind of drugs would we use to treat this disorder, right? Because folks who, uh, you know, they, they go see their mental health professional and they say, hey, I've got these symptoms. They match up with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. They're going to try, um, typically, they're going to try dopamine antagonists, right? So one of the major hypotheses, and we'll talk about this a little bit, uh, with uh, schizophrenia is what we call the dopamine hypothesis, right? So folks who have schizophrenia seem to have in certain brain regions elevated dopamine levels, right? If your dopamine levels get too high, that's what gives you in particular those positive symptoms. So what we'll do is we'll give someone a dopamine antagonist. We're going to try to knock down their dopamine levels, right? Okay. That's pretty effective, mostly for those positive symptoms, right? Unfortunately, most of the drugs that we have to treat schizophrenia only work on the positive symptoms. They only work on those, uh, those thought disorders, the uh, delusions, the hallucinations. They don't do much for the negative symptoms, you know, that uh, lack of, uh, you know, that flat affect, anhedonia, the social withdrawal. Drugs that we have to treat schizophrenia don't really work on that. They work on those positive symptoms. You have to do sort of other things to address those negative symptoms and the cognitive symptoms. Now the problem with treating someone with a dopamine antagonist is, and uh, Casey, I don't know how much you talked about Parkinson's disease. Uh, so spoiler alert, uh, if you don't have enough dopamine, you eventually get Parkinson's disease, right? So you guys talked about that. You lose those dopaminergic cells in that nigrostriatal pathway, you're going to get a movement disorder. The same thing will happen to folks if they're treated for schizophrenia long enough. If you're not careful, if the dose gets too high, if they're on this too long, they'll develop, uh, it depends on who you ask, kind of think about it two different ways. There's something called tardive dyskinesia and Parkinsonism, right? Uh, so it's kind of like Parkinson's likes symptoms. Again, it's because we're treating folks with a dopamine antagonist. We're artificially dropping their dopamine levels. Now the opposite will happen if you treat someone for, for Parkinson's disease long enough. If you treat them with something like L-DOPA, precursor to dopamine, eventually they'll develop schizophrenic-like symptoms, right? Because dopamine seems to be the major player here in both of these disorders going in different directions. Now there are some ways around this. Uh, recently there have been, uh, there's been some work with what we call like partial antagonist or partial agonist. So things that work better than nothing, but not as good as like full-on dopamine, right? So they'll give you a boost enough to kind of alleviate some symptoms, but not so much that it puts you over into this other sort of problem, right? Saying I think about that like tax brackets sometimes, right? So like previously we were just giving people a raise just enough to put them in the next tax bracket so they actually bring home less money. Uh, with a partial agonist or antagonist, we give you just enough of a raise to get you at the top of your current tax bracket so you're actually bringing home more money, but you're not paying more taxes. So you're actually getting a raise, right? So it's actually helpful to you. So, um, so that's kind of how I, I think about uh, partial agonist and antagonist. So they seem to be pretty good. Also, another reason we know that dopamine seems to be a major player in schizophrenia is uh, if you give someone a dopamine agonist, like, I don't know, cocaine seems to be a good dopamine agonist. If you give somebody cocaine, they'll actually experience some psychotic symptoms, right? Similar to schizophrenia. So it's always a, a question if you guys are ever working in a, in a clinical setting and someone comes in and you're like, I don't know if this guy's schizophrenic or he's on cocaine. Uh, and, th and that's a true, true question. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really know how you resolve that other than just like wait, uh, you know, put them in a room without cocaine and then see if the symptoms go away. Um, if they do, then it was probably cocaine. If they don't, well, they're probably schizophrenic, right? And so I think that's a good way to get you a differential diagnosis there. But that is, that is troubling sometimes, especially you bring somebody in, you do a drug panel on them, right? And you're like, oh man, they got a lot of cocaine metabolites in there. They're also hearing voices. Well, um, is that because of the cocaine or they, you know, they say they've got some other problems as well? You have to kind of wait and find out.
All right. We already talked about that. There's some other idea, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because it wasn't right, but uh, so I don't really you know, feel like you need to know a whole lot about these D2 receptors and other things right now. But there were some folks who thought, well, hey, D2 receptors seem to be an issue, but uh, they're probably not really what's driving the issue. What's driving schizophrenia is just that increased uh, amount of dopamine, right? Now, again, this is not an increase in dopamine um, necessarily everywhere, right? It's just an increase in dopamine in certain places. And that that's why these drugs that work globally cause problems. So with Parkinson's, we were saying like, oh, you've got a decrease in dopamine, you know, headed uh, from the substantia nigra to the striatum. Okay, well, let's give you some dopamine, you know, or a precursor to raise dopamine levels. That's going to raise dopamine levels everywhere, including like your prefrontal cortex, right? So it's going to raise dopamine levels all over the place, even in some of those other pathways. So as of yet, we don't have a great way to specifically target we just want to increase dopamine in one particular region. I think we're getting there. We've got some great techniques coming out soon. Um, they've got these like designer receptors now, which are kind of cool. So they've got ion channels that are coupled to a receptor for a substance that's not in your body at all. It's an artificial substance some guy in a laboratory makes. And they can inject these into your brain cells in certain regions. And then they can give you a pill with that drug in it and it's only going to work on that small brain region where they injected those special receptors, right? Which is kind of cool. I think that's probably the wave of the future, right? If you've got Parkinson's disease, uh, you get one kind of brain surgery. We're going to inject these, uh, the DNA for these ion channels, make a few of your brain cells, make those ion channels, and then you just take this pill the rest of your life. And it actually causes those cells, those ion channels to open and close and uh, kind of bypasses a lot of other things. Pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Um, you guys should be watching out for that. I think your your imaginary kids or grandkids will, will would use those. Because you guys I know aren't going to have children, so we can discuss that. So. Right, Casey? We've taken care of that for you. Uh, there's a thing called hypofrontality. This is like another sort of aspect of uh, schizophrenia. This is probably what's causing the uh, negative symptoms and maybe even the cognitive symptoms, your prefrontal cortex probably isn't doing what it should, right? You really need that prefrontal cortex for your higher order planning, all of your sort of, uh, you know, extended attention and thinking and complex problem solving things. Uh, and if your prefrontal uh, cortex is not working, then, you know, it's not going to be, uh, you're not going to be doing those things like you should. This is possibly related to glutamate. You guys remember glutamate, that excitatory neurotransmitter? Uh, it seems like folks with schizophrenia have a reduced uh, concentration of glutamate in their cerebrospinal fluid. So they're not dumping out as much glutamate as you would anticipate, which is again going to cause some uh, reduction in activity. And yes, you can uh, you can treat these folks with like PCP. I know, right? That's pretty interesting. Um, uh, PCP works on that glutamate receptor, right? So to kind of work on some of those negative um, symptoms. Let's see. Here's that partial agonist story we were just talking about. You guys can read about that. Yeah, here are. Uh, here is a, uh, a test. This was actually with monkeys, right? And so what they did uh, is they gave these monkeys uh, PCP, and they found that there was actually an increase in the uh, sort of persistence of these monkeys, like uh, making incorrect responses. So that kind of showed that they had... Um, sort of continued drive and initiative, right? I know you would think like normally, like why would you want to keep making an incorrect response, right? But sometimes 
uh, you drop something, and you like have to keep reaching for it, and you keep missing, right? And, like you have to just keep keep reaching. You just want to like, give up, right? Like drop my keys. Well, I'm just gonna leave them there. I guess I'm sleeping outside tonight. Uh, you know, you're gonna have to you know, keep trying to get the keys from wherever you dropped them. Maybe drop them down, like you know, under your seat or something in your car. Um, so that's sort of an analogous task here. I wouldn't recommend taking PCP to help you find your keys. Like if, if anybody's dealing with that specifically, Zach, I just want to toss that out there. Uh, huh? Yeah, yeah, I don't know, right? Sometimes people just really, you know, they only listen to one thing you say. <laughs> Apparently there's a whole group around here that thinks I told them they should do LSD, and that's not exactly what I said. I said, if you're going to do a drug, you should do LSD. That's completely different. You know, if you're going to do one, do the one that's safest, right? And that's what I say. That's good advice, Casey, and you know it. Uh, don't worry about too much. I love this, the name of this, uh, DISC-1. It's the best name ever for a gene. Uh, DISC-1 stands for Disrupted in Schizophrenia. I know, right? They got really creative on that name. So this gene screwed up in folks who have schizophrenia. Why don't we call it Disrupted in Schizophrenia? That's the name of the gene. So you don't have to worry about that. Here's the story about those partial agonists. Again, they work a little better than nothing, uh, but not quite as good as a full agonist, right? And so that would be a way to sort of increase function, but not increase it to the point that it causes a problem. The opposite story is true for a partial antagonist, right? It's a way to decrease activity a little bit, but not decrease it down to zero, right? So that you actually like would develop a movement disorder. All right, we could talk a little bit about affective disorders. Basically, you've got bipolar and major depressive disorder. I'm going to kind of skip through this. All kinds of treatments. Um, I'm sure you folks are probably familiar with a lot of these. There are different antidepressants. Some of these are monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Those guys prevent the, the enzyme that breaks down your monoamines from working, so you have more monoamines available. Uh, other drugs to treat uh, are typically um, SSRIs, right? You guys are familiar with selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors? I'm sure we all know someone who's taking an SSRI, right? They're pretty commonly prescribed for a variety of things. They prevent the reuptake of serotonin. More serotonin seems to make you... Um, seems to make your uh, depression dissipate a bit, as well as some other issues. Also, uh, ketamine seems to be an effective way to treat depression. Again, I would not recommend, you know, just like on your own, trying ketamine. Uh, ketamine being, uh, you know, a common date rape drug. It's used recreationally. It's a dissociative anesthetic. Anybody have cats or horses or dogs or, I don't know, fish? You could probably anesthetize a fish with a dose of ketamine. Uh, ketamine is used as a veterinary anesthetic, but it does work. Uh, sometimes uh, there's even evidence that says even up to three months out from a ketamine dose, uh, your depression actually is, is alleviated. So I think there needs to be some more work before we start, you know, just shooting people with ketamine to make them feel better. But there you go. All right, let's skip this. Oh, exercise helps. Everybody knows that, right? Exercise actually promotes neurogenesis, uh, and that'll actually help you. So, just another reason to exercise, right? Create more brain cells while you're doing it. I don't know. I think you're running low. Uh, circadian rhythm. Oh, this is the other thing I wouldn't recommend as a long term sort of solution for. Um, depression, but uh, sleep deprivation works, right? You stay up for two or three days, amazingly you start feeling better, uh, at least your depression. I mean, some other things might be giving you problems at that point, but sleep deprivation actually works. So, which sort of makes some sense if you think about one of the 
the major complaints of folks who are depressed are disruptions in their sleep patterns, right? So it's sort of like, uh, how many of you have the hiccups and you like hold your breath to get rid of your hiccups, right? So you kind of like squeeze things around and get back to that normal uh, pattern of breathing, right? That makes some sense. Sort of the same idea here with your uh, sleep patterns. If you kind of like stay awake for a few days, then maybe you'll kind of get back to that normal sleep pattern. Here's sort of, uh, you know, this is a, a person diagnosed with depression, and here's sort of your standard, uh, you know, normal sleep cycles. You can see how disrupted they are, uh, how often they wake up in the night. Their REM sleep patterns are all, all different. I mean, what's really interesting, you know, they just kind of have this uh, very early and long REM sleep, right? That that folks who normally you got to get it down to like stage four sleep and then pop back up to REM sleep, right? These folks just go right into REM sleep. Uh, so that's kind of this uh, disrupted uh, REM sleep pattern. Do, 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 we talked about that. It actually works in like two thirds of the folks, right? So this is um, pretty impressive if you start to think about uh, actually, you know, developing a treatment for depression. One of the reasons it's so difficult to get a drug to market for depression is quite often just like sitting down and talking to someone who's depressed will make them feel just as good as the drug, right? And so anytime you give someone a drug, you want to make sure that the benefit they're getting is actually uh, better than placebo, right? You don't want them to just, you know, take a drug with all these side effects uh, even, you know, SSRIs have side effects, right? Um, they're not as bad as some antidepressants. Some of the early antidepressants, one of the big side effects was sexual dysfunction. Um, and there's nothing in the world that'll get you depressed like some sexual dysfunction. Um, so nobody's going to comment on it. Nobody knows anything about that. No idea what you're talking about there. Um, but, uh, but, you know, SSRIs don't seem to be as bad for that, but that, that does still happen. So, um, But, yeah, if you can just, like, sit down and talk to somebody and you start feeling better, why should, I mean, there's no side effects to that, right? So typically, what is it, the kindly professor? Is that what they call that control group sometimes? Have you heard of this? So, like, often when they, um, when they test a drug for depression, when it gets to clinical trials, you know, have one group take the drug. The, uh, one of the other groups, they'll make you go talk to a guy in a cardigan. And you just have to go sit in his office and talk to him for a little bit. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. That's not what it's called, though, is it? The Kindly Professor? <laughs> That's what we'll call it from now on. We're just going to rename it. It's called The Kindly Professor. He has to wear a cardigan. I'm certain about this. Uh, and and that's, that's just how that goes. So there you go. Um, yeah, so basically this is a graph just showing what I just told you. Sleep deprivation works. It's pretty effective. You can get something that works in two-thirds of the patients and doesn't cause any side effects, really. I, you know, go for it, right? Uh, we've already talked about um, circadian rhythms, phototherapy. We joked around a little bit about, you know, if you move to Alaska, they give you a floor lamp to keep you happy in the, in the dark months. Casey, that's true. You're looking at me like I like I was thinking about Alaska for some reason, and, and all of a sudden I'm like, it gets dark there all the time. So, and that's and then you can't see that's uh, you can't see the bears when they jump out to eat you because it's dark. Did we talk about the roller bears in this class? So you know things are getting hotter, right? Just like in general, and because of that, polar bears are getting really agitated. Um, and so they're getting so agitated, they're like coming down to non-polar bear places, right? And then those other kinds of bears that are also really big, like those grizzly bears, right? They're actually like, hey, man, it's kind of warmer. I'm going to keep going this way. And then like a polar bear and a grizzly bear, they meet up. And like, you know, if you're a polar bear and you meet a grizzly bear, what are you going to do? Um, well, that's what they do. Yeah, and then they have something called a growler bear that comes out. I don't know how long. What's the gestational period on it? bear do you have any idea i'm gonna say like 12 months later i don't know how long it takes to grow a bear um and so they're like these like hybrids of grizzly bears and polar bears true story true story and they're frightening all right 
Oh, melatonin. Did we talk about melatonin? Did I tell you guys not to take melatonin? No, I didn't tell you that. Hey, I wouldn't recommend taking melatonin. Um, so don't raise your hand if you're doing it now. Uh, there was a study with mice a number of years ago. And I don't remember the details on it, like how much melatonin they were giving these mice. But they noticed that it caused their gonads to sh shrink. Um, and I'm going to assume most, if not all, of you have gonads, right? Um, that's just an assumption I make about most people when I meet them, right? Some of them, you know, some of you keep them sort of a little more inside than others. That's fine. Uh, wherever you keep them, you got them, right? So ovaries and testicles. Uh, melatonin might shrink those things up. So I would worry about that. Questions? Comments? Concerns? Before we move on to something else. Well, that's great, I guess. Let's see if we can get this to load. Did you get the text message from the university? No. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Comments? You don't have to make any. I didn't. I didn't know that they did either. I was a little surprised. Hey, guess what, folks? We're open tomorrow. Just letting you know. In case you thought otherwise. Apparently the rest of the state of West Virginia is closed tomorrow. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, didn't even know that was happening. No, that's what Casey and I, I didn't realize. You, you know, I, I mean, it, it makes sense, of course. Uh, although there's like some part of me that thinks like, well, what if everybody, like, like the whole place is going to shut down, right? I mean, I mean like, like to, to shut down like the state of West Virginia for a day, it's like, ah, right? But like if all, but if like all states shut down simultaneously for a day, right? Like. Like, a lot of things stop, right? I just don't know. I think about these things. Yeah. I don't know. And that's not, that's not a, a political commentary one way or the other. I don't want anybody to, you know, put me in one group or the other. I'd like to put myself in whatever group I belong in. I feel like 80% of the class doesn't even know why... Like, I didn't know they were closed, fine. But I know why they would be closed if they were closed. Like, if I go to the bank tomorrow, I'm like, oh, I got it. Yeah, the post office is closed. Yeah, the post office is closed, right? I mean, that's a, you know, it's a big one, right? You know, only like 39 times says someone who's been president died, right? Is that true? 39 times? How many of them are there? 45? And how many of them are still alive? One, two. Clinton. So five are alive? Yeah. So I guess 40 times. That's not that much. I mean, it makes it a worthwhile day, right? I mean, that's what I mean. All right. Let's talk about stress, anxiety, and some neurodevelopmental disorders. We'll hit the high notes here. Uh, what is stress? Anybody ever experienced that before? Stress was October 11th. That was the midterm. <laughs> that was a joke. I, I don't know if it was the. I think it was the 11th. Uh, for us, we're concerned about that physiological reaction caused by the perception of an aversive or threatening response. Not a big deal, right? We have your stress response. Typically, we think about fight or flight. Uh, there's that third kind of freeze in there as well, right? Uh, so fight, flight, or freeze. Now, stress is pretty aw awesome, actually, uh, because stress will get you to do some amazing things, right? How many of you have ever cleaned your entire house or apartment in 30 minutes because you found out someone important was coming over to visit and you hadn't cleaned yet? And that stressed you out, right? I've done that before, right? I don't know, right? So you're like, oh, geez, I gotta, you know. My wife says, wake up. I'm like, I'm taking a nap. She's like, yeah, but, you know, my mom's coming over. I'm like, well, can I still take a nap? 
No, I had to get up and clean. Uh, so. That's fine. Uh, other times, stress will make you do awesome things. If you've ever been sort of uh, attacked, right? Or you've been in a, in a stressful situation where you needed to uh, remove yourself from that situation with some speed, right? I mean, you need to liberate these nutrients and you've got these hormones going and you've got your, uh, you know, your adrenal glands there, right? You get that adrenaline rush. Kind of have that awesome thing going. That's great. You're going to increase your blood pressure. That's pretty cool, right? Uh, if you need to deliver oxygen to your muscles, increasing that heart rate and blood pressure is one of the best ways to do that, right? You're going to start breathing faster. All of this, you know, coming through that uh, sympathetic branch there of your autonomic nervous system, rightly all that's going to be awesome, right? That's going to do some cool things for you. The problem uh, becomes when you have that sort of extended and prolonged uh, stress response, right? And over time, your blood pressure is always elevated and your heart rate's always up and you're always releasing glucocorticoids, right? When that's the situation, and that can cause you some serious long-term problems, really we're worried about cardiovascular disease, but there are also some neurological effects. Glucocorticoids are really great at killing brain cells in your hippocampus, right? Uh, which you need your hippocampus to like, you know, consolidate those memories. So you're gonna have a lot of trouble, uh, you know, some memory issues if you're always stressed. A lot of this is going through what we call the HPA axis, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. All we mean by that is your hypothalamus releases a hormone that tells your pituitary gland to release a hormone that tells your adrenal glands to release that stress hormone. That's it. That's the end of the story. The end result is going to be that glucocorticoid, right? So it's going to start with a couple of these other hormones, but uh, eventually we end up with like cortisol. You guys heard of cortisol, right? Yeah, that's a major glucocorticoid. Not a big deal. And here's the story. Hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal gland. All right. We're going to release some, um, some hormones there out of your adrenal gland. This is kind of interesting study. Uh, they looked at folks who were air traffic controllers. Some of these were at uh, high stress airports. You know, like a high stress airport might be like, uh, I don't know, Chicago O'Hare, right? That's a pretty, pretty busy airport. Low stress airport, that might be like, uh, you know, Tri State and Canova. Pretty, pretty low stress airport. I don't know if any of you have ever been in or out of there. Um, I love that they say they have three gates. They have three doors that lead out to where they park the airplane. It's not really three gates. Uh, somebody will, like, take your ticket. And they'll also, like, you know, check your bags. They'll also load the bag. And then I think I saw them once put on a pilot's uniform. Uh, I think it was all the same guy. Uh, there was a second person that they need because they have to have somebody out there to crank the propeller to get it started. So they do have at least two people who work at that airport. That I know. Uh, but I think that might be the extent of it. So I think that's a low stress airport. So if you look at the development of hypertension, high blood pressure, uh, high stress, they're much more likely to develop high blood pressure than those folks who work in a, um, in a low stress environment. What's really interesting is, you know, this, this kind of time period here from that 35 to 45 year, once you hit like 45, you know, the likelihood that you're gonna have hypertension sort of drastically increases for everybody. But look at that, that offset there, right? I mean, these folks are developing severe hypertension. You know, they're getting that 10 years earlier than folks who work in that low-stress environment, right? So there you go. Pick a low-stress job, right? Like, uh, like a really good low-stress job, Casey, is listening to people talk about past abuses, current, current abuses, uh, listening to them wanting to kill themselves. Very low-stress, right? The most low stress. You guys are in the wrong line of work. It's not hard at all, right? Never, 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 right? Never. So you should get a job like I don't know, putting wheels together. There's no stress there. Just put a wheel. You don't have to worry about taking that home. Like, oh man, I'm worried about that wheel. No. <laughs> Cars and stuff, 
ended up, because they never got to see really the result of their work, they were just doing a small part of the automobile building that they had lots of like... Yeah, there's there's some, uh, so you need a low stress job that lets you see projects to completion, gives you a lot of creativity uh, and a lot of flexibility. So good luck with that, folks. I don't know. There you go. Um, also, what are some other long term effects of stress? High blood pressure, damage to muscles, you can get diabetes, infertility, uh, inhibition of growth. Not really something you have to worry about. At, 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 any of your ages uh, at this point. Uh, you reduce your inflammatory response, you actually suppress your immune system. So, I'm telling you this, Morgan, not so you can use it as an excuse to not be here next week, okay? But there is a relationship, there is a correlation between stress and things like wound healing. There is a relationship between uh, final exams and students actually getting sick, not really faking you out, although there are a number of those who will say, oh man, I was so sick and I had to go to the, uh, you know, the free walk-in clinic and they told me, yes, you were here. Um, <laughs> that was your illness that day. You were here. I don't know. You don't really give me any more information than that. But there is a correlation between, uh, you know, like final exams and uh, this was particularly true for med students. I don't think it's true for any other group of students. Uh, since you guys aren't med students, it doesn't work, right, Andre? So just don't pull that one on me. I'm ready for it. Uh, we also said that uh, glucocorticoids will destroy uh, part of the hippocampus, in particular the CA1. Right? They actually decrease the entry of glucose and they decrease the reuptake of glutamate. And that's how they actually uh, destroy those cells. So that's kind of the cellular mechanism there. Uh, prenatal stress can actually cause long lasting malfunctions in learning and memory. Right? So if any of you think you have some uh, learning and memory problems, you need to go back in time and tell your mom to relax. Uh, and that'll definitely help. If any of you are going to have children, try to relax while you do that, right? Like, like for that whole period, like for a couple years. Plan ahead, a year, right? Like get your vitamins and diet straightened out. Uh, you know, paint your nursery with something not lead-based. Uh, <laughs> I love those. Uh, I actually thought this was a good, I, and often I don't, but I thought this was a good advertisement. Um, I was driving uh, to campus and I saw this sign that said lead paint comes with a lifetime guarantee. And I thought, that's not right. And then I thought, the next line says it causes problems for generations. It's like, oh yeah, that is right. That was a good one. Got my attention. So there you go. Avoid the lead paint. Mm -hmm. All right. This is not anything to worry about. It's basically a graph showing you that um, if you expose a rat to the smell of a cat, it gets stressed out, starts releasing some glucocorticoids, not as good at learning, so you got some problems there. This is interesting. So early life stress, so we're thinking about, you know, what's the fun acronym for early life stress? ACEs, right? adverse childhood experiences, right? Basically, the more adverse childhood experiences you have, the harder things are going to be on you later. The more likely you are to develop just about every sort of uh, mental health problem you can imagine. And in particular, uh, what's kind of interesting here is these early life stress events will decrease the volume of part of your prefrontal cortex, right? So it actually has a direct relationship on neurological development, which I think is actually kind of fascinating, right? When you can map something on to that neurological development, you can say, yes, early life stress will cause a decrease in the volume of this particular brain region. We already talked before about prefrontal cortex, uh, some of the role of prefrontal cortex and impulse control, you know, some of the other um, interactions there with the amygdala. Don't worry about this too much. Don't worry about that too much. All right. Here's that whole branch of neuroscience that's looking at, uh, you know, basically the environment, the nervous system, and your immune system. It's called psychoneuroimmunology. I'm not going to hit you too hard with this antigen antibody business. If you're interested in it, I say check it out. Um, these are basically parts of your immune system. 
You guys have probably heard about these. But uh, in particular, we want to talk about something called cytokines. And glucocorticoids will actually interfere directly with these cytokines. And this is how stress will cause your immune system response to be decreased, right? So these glucocorticoids, they get in there and they, they kind of screw around with these messages from the cytokines. The cytokines are what's really great. Uh, they're really great at getting other parts of your immune system to go to a specific location, right, to, to fight off an infection. And if you're not able to convey that message properly, then you're not going to be getting the resources to that location to help you fight off that infection. So there you go. This is kind of interesting too. So these are uh, spouses of folks with Alzheimer's and they were also their uh, caregivers, right? And they actually found that if you give these folks uh, a bacterial pneumonia vaccine, they actually have a weakened response, like a, like a weaker response to that. So anytime you guys get a vaccine for something, right, and I hope you guys do that every opportunity, if they're passing out free vaccinations, just sign up, right? Uh, because somebody's saying, not only are you not going to get this disease, but we're going to not give it to you for free, right? So that's pretty awesome. How many of you had the hepatitis A? So I, I Thanksgiving, whatever, right? So I decide like, hey, I'm, I'm actually like painting my basement on Thanksgiving because it's, it's, I don't know, right? It's something to do. So I'm painting my basement and I, I get hungry. I'm like, well, all right, I'm going to go get something to eat. Not really, you know, I just don't think like Thanksgiving, right? So I got to drive like almost two towns over to find something open because I don't live in Huntington, right? So I, I live somewhere else. And the only thing I find open is a steak and shake. I'm like, well, all right, whatever. Right? I was like, I'm not going to cook at home. I'm covered in paint. I'm just going to get something. I pull up to the window, and I, like at first this was comforting to me. It said, everyone who works at this location has had the hepatitis A vaccination. And then I thought, I'm just going to eat at home. <laughs> I don't know. So there you go. Uh, but anytime you get a vaccination, your uh, antibody levels are going to go up, right? Because that's basically what a vaccine does. It increases your antibody levels. That way, when that particular, uh, you know, antigen, that particular invader, whatever that is, comes into your body, you've got something ready to attack it and destroy it, right? And so if you have these uh, vaccines, they'll often do a, uh, you have to do a blood test, right, to make sure that your antibody levels are high enough. I had to have the rabies vaccine a few years ago. It was a three-step thing. They had to give me three shots, uh, which were not pleasant. And then I had to go back, and they had to take my blood, and they had to measure my um, rabies antibodies to make sure the level was high enough so that I actually had some protection against getting rabies. And I did, so that was great. Uh, but if it hadn't been, they would have to give me more shots uh, up until the point that my, my blood levels of rabies antibodies were high enough. So if they're not high enough, it's not going to help you. So if any of you are rabid and you try to bite me, it's going to irritate me, but I'm not going to get rabies from it. Although I might spontaneously develop rabies later in life. So you guys should watch out for that. If I start like foaming at the mouth in the middle of class, make sure I'm not like reading your exams, because that'll do it to me anyway. All right, let's see. Not a big deal. Uh, this is basically everything I've said, but in graphical form. We could talk about post-traumatic stress a little bit. Um, what I think is interesting is gender differences. When we think about post-traumatic stress, at least in the last decade or so, we typically think about it in sort of a military setting, right? We think about uh, veterans coming back with post-traumatic stress disorder, and that's a very serious thing. We should really spend some time trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and we typically think about males being affected by this, who we typically think about filling those roles, which seems to be true. Uh, but women are actually much more likely to develop post-traumatic stress disorder than men, given the same sort of conditions, right? So that's kind of interesting. Uh, what's also sort of interesting about this is uh, you're more likely to develop post-traumatic stress disorder from like a uh, something like a mugging 
right, like a personal interaction, like an assault, than you are from something like a tornado or a hurricane that's like less personal, right? Because like a hurricane comes through and it's just like, well, I mean, that hurricane wasn't really like directly trying to get me, despite whatever you might think. Uh, you know, it's not, not as directed at your person as something else might be. Uh, PTSD, we're thinking about, you have these sort of recurrent recollections of that traumatic event. You got experienced a lot of stress, flashbacks, right? You have an exaggerated sort of fear response to something, um, which is sort of interesting. Did we talk about Tetris in this class? All right, we'll talk about that in just a moment when we talk about treatments. Now, there is some heritability, but again, you have to have that environment, uh, that environmental sort of stimulus to develop PTSD, right? Even if you have all of the genes that make you uh, susceptible or more susceptible to PTSD, doesn't mean you're going to get it. You actually have to have that environmental event, and even folks who are not as susceptible can develop PTSD given the right conditions. Uh, what's one thing that would um, increase the likelihood that you would develop PTSD? ACEs, right? Those adverse childhood experiences. The more of those you have, that's just going to raise your baseline, right? It's going to kind of already have you on edge there. Your amygdala is already going to be ready to just be overactive, right? It's already going to be kind of teetering on the edge there. So when you experience something that's traumatic as an adult, your amygdala is already wired and geared and ready for that. It's just ready to take off. All right. So we talked about that. Uh, monozygotic twins, you know, uh, it's not a perfect relationship, but it is, it is pretty, uh, pretty close. Uh, this is sort of interesting. They measured people's activity in the amygdala and the medial prefrontal cortex, and this is for folks with PTSD and, and without, uh, and they gave them either a fearful face or a happy face. And I think this is kind of fascinating. Um, if you show someone with PTSD a happy face, their amygdala still gets pretty excited about that, right? If you show somebody with, uh, you know, without PTSD a happy face or a fearful face, their amygdala, you know, not a lot of activity there, right? Just a little bit. But this kind of shows you that already someone with PTSD, even when they're seeing a happy face, their amygdala is already geared up, right? It's already ready for something negative. It's already ready for that fear stimulus. So it's no wonder that you can kind of have that exaggerated response, right? So when they do see a fearful face, I mean, there's like a, there's a massive amount of increase in the activation. If you compare a fearful face in someone with PTSD and a fearful face uh, in a control subject, and you look at their amygdala activity, you can see it's a it's a major difference in activity. What I also think is fascinating is this sort of crossed relationship here in the medial prefrontal cortex, right? We said prefrontal cortex was going to be involved in um, sort of inhibiting reactions, right? Sort of like holding you back a little bit. So for a control, happy face, okay, so it gets a little excited. Fearful face, it gets more excited, right? So, okay, you're thinking, well, the prefrontal cortex is exhibiting a little bit more impulse control on that amygdala, right? And kind of holding you back a little bit so you can kind of analyze the situation and make the decision you need to. Folks with PTSD, what I think is fascinating is they're actually, their prefrontal cortex is more activated by a happy face than it is by a fearful face, right? So when they see that fearful face, not only is their amygdala jacked up that much, but their prefrontal cortex is dropped down so they're not getting any sort of impulse control or inhibition on that at all, and so then that's an even bigger difference. So what are some common treatments for PTSD? Uh, different therapeutic, right? So if um, somebody's afraid of, uh, you know, uh, exposure therapy, sometimes you try that, right? That's really great, right? Since people write under chairs. Uh, so, so there's that. Um, antidepressants, right, that's another thing. I think one of the things you really have to worry about with folks with any of these disorders, and we haven't really talked about this much, is self-medicating and trying to prevent them from self-medicating, right? Uh, quite often we see uh, what we call comorbidity, two things at once, right, Zach? So not only is somebody dealing with PTSD, they're also dealing with an alcohol use disorder, right? Because they're using that alcohol to kind of reduce 
some of that activity, right? So, so alcohol being an inhibitor, right? If your amygdala is always jacked up and you're always on edge, you think, hey, you know, just give me a case of Miller Lite, right? That's going to take care of it for me. And so you'll just, you know, drink and try to calm down a little bit. And then, of course, you develop some problems that way as well. Oh, but what about Tetris? So there was a study of a few years ago. It was a really fascinating study. You guys all know Tetris, right? That game that uh, you know, like your great great grandparents played. It's so old. Uh, <laughs> I don't know when Tetris debuted. Yeah, I think it was in the eighties as well. Uh, so Tetris. Uh, so they these folks did this study a couple years ago, where they took folks and they made them watch a video. It was like a 12-minute video, and it had little clips of, like, uh, real-life amputations, fatal car accidents, and it had these real stressful sort of events, right? And these folks would watch this. And what they would do is they would write in their journals sort of immediately afterward how many sort of, you know, persistent sort of visualizations they had, right? So you guys have all seen movies, right? How many times have you seen a movie, and then, you, you know, you're like, you're later, and then you kind of have like, you know, like a scene from the movie kind of pops in your head, right? And that's a normal experience, okay? So that's what these folks were writing down. Like, how many times does this a scene from that film clip, does that jump in my head? And they'll write in their journal. They did it sort of at an immediate time point, and then like, you know, all the way out to six weeks later, right? And they were kind of writing this stuff down. So there were two groups, though. There was just the control group, watch the video, write stuff down. The other group watched the video and then played 10 minutes of Tetris. Right? What was fascinating is the folks who played Tetris had a significant reduction in not only sort of those immediate, you know, recurrent visualizations or flashbacks, if you're thinking about it in PTSD terms, but also six weeks out, they saw a reduction uh, in those visualizations, right? So now that's only like one symptom, right? But it's pretty cool. The, the reasoning behind why that worked is they were saying that the... Uh, Tetris was competing with the visual spatial memory uh, functions of that video clip, and they weren't able to as deeply encode that video clip because they were sitting there, you know, playing Tetris, and that sort of visual spatial task was competing with their resources. They weren't able to to get that in there. Now, think like, are there really practical implications for this? Right. Well, there sort of are. Um, they actually waited. They made the folks wait like 30 minutes before they played Tetris. The reason for that, the average wait at a at a U.S. emergency room is like 30 minutes, right? So that's a pretty, you know, that's a good sort of time frame. So if you were, you know, bringing people into the ER, right, and you could give them some visual spatial task, Tetris, everybody has access to Tetris, right? If you've got a smartphone, a tablet, a computer, you've got access to Tetris. Right? There's an app that you can download, I'm certain, to play Tetris, right? So you could give people an app to play Tetris and it. Somebody's going to like yell at you, like, why am I playing Tetris? But you could give them some other task, right? That might be a visual spatial task um, that they could do while they were waiting, and that could reduce the likelihood that they develop PTSD. I don't know. I think it's kind of a fascinating thing. Um, so there you go. What about anxiety disorders? Let's shift gears a little bit. Um, these are disorders when folks expect some kind of impending disaster. Always on the lookout. Uh, panic disorders, right, is when you're actually going to have uh, some, some irregularities in breathing, your heart rate. Uh, a lot of folks will confuse this for uh, a heart attack. Nothing will give you a panic uh, attack like a heart attack, right? You're having a heart attack. Uh, and then there's this anticipatory anxiety. So this is when things are to the point where you're, you're having anxiety about having anxiety, right? So you're like afraid to go out because you're anxious. If you go out, you're going to have a panic attack. So, so you don't end up going out and you um, develop agoraphobia, right? So these are folks who, who don't leave their, uh, their homes very often. And in fact, there are even folks who have agoraphobia who uh, will only go in certain parts of their homes, right? They may not go throughout the entire extent of their home uh, if they can see, you know, if they can kind of look out a window somewhere, they may not go in that room, right? Because they don't want to see the outside world and they're kind of afraid of that. 
We've got generalized anxiety disorder. That's um, kind of exactly what it says it is. It's pretty self-explanatory. Social anxiety disorder. Uh, you're you're afraid uh, that other folks are always you know criticizing you and putting you under scrutiny, um, and so you kind of withdraw from social situations. It does seem to be heritable, um, but it's not again perfect. There's that GABA receptor. How do you treat this? Um, typically, you give folks things that activate their GABA receptors a bit, right? Because you want to kind of reduce anxiety by increasing inhibition. So you can give them things like benzodiazepines, right? That'll open that, um, that chloride ion channel. You don't want to really take a benzodiazepine for an extended period of time. They're not that great, right? They're awesome if you're having a total freak out and we need to like, you know, put you down for a couple minutes. Benzodiazepines are perfect for that. Uh, they're not a maintenance medication, right? And so, uh, unfortunately, a lot of folks have been on benzodiazepines for months, years, and this is bad. And if you're on a benzodiazepine and you've been on one for a very long time, I would recommend you talk to your mental health professional about that. If they tell you, oh, it's fine, I'd get another mental health professional. Uh, that's, just, that's just me telling you that, you know. I'm not a mental health professional, but I play one on TV. Uh, <laughs> so there you go. Um, anybody know what fluvoxamine is? It's an SSRI. Yeah, it's right there, right? Uh, so it, it also works on panic disorders. SSRIs, again, we said you maybe take that for depression. You can also take that if you're irritable. You can take it if you're... Um, you know, you, you have anxiety or a panic disorder, SSRIs seem to be pretty good for just about everything. All right, we've got OCD. Uh, this is an obsessive compulsive disorder. So this is the day where I want to like kind of straighten out things. Like people say, oh, I'm schizophrenic. Schizophrenic means you hear voices. That's really about it, right? It doesn't mean like you've got split personality. That's like a whole other made up thing. So we're not going to worry about that. Uh, OCD, right? It doesn't mean you like things clean. Okay, uh, that's just being normal and hygienic, so so you're okay there. Uh, you know, if you like to stack your magazines, just stack your magazines, right? You're not OCD, right? OCD is when you wash your hands so much they bleed. Okay, that's OCD, right? You have to have an obsession, whatever that is, right? Your germs are going to get you. Your house is going to burn down. Somebody's going to break into your home. Okay, and your compulsion, you've got to wash your hands 15 times every time. You know, you touch raw chicken. I don't know, right? At least whatever. So maybe stop eating raw chicken. Uh, or you're afraid your house is going to burn down, so you've got to check your smoke alarms five times every day, right? And you got to do it five times. You just got to because maybe the first four times it didn't work, so that fifth time, you know, it's a real check, right? Um, and then you know, how many of you? It's perfectly normal. You lock your door, you check it, right? You don't check it 30 times. 30 times means you have OCD. Check it once or twice, you're normal, right? Okay, so. And, that's fine. You worry about something, perfectly normal. Uh, obsessions and compulsions are, it's a whole other level. Right? It's a disruptive level. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, the compulsion is to solve or address the obsession. So if you're obsessed about germs, you're going to wash your hands, right? So that's going to be the, the behavior. Yeah, it addresses, because the obsession was, Germs are going to make me sick and kill me, so I'm going to have to wash my hands to get rid of those germs. I have to keep doing it. Somebody's going to break into my house. That's my obsession. I'm afraid someone's going to break into my house. The compulsion is to continue to check my doors to make sure they're locked. All right, so I'm going to go through this ritual. Right. It's really kind of interesting because OCD, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about autism and uh, Parkinson's disease, all of these disorders that have a movement component, they actually involve the basal ganglia. People don't typically think about the basal ganglia when they think about these disorders. Tourette's is another example. Uh, typically, we think about Tourette's of someone just like randomly yelling out swear words, right? Uh, there may be many reasons why you're randomly yelling out swear words, you know, not Tourette's. Tourette's is typically a facial tic, right? That's, that's the most standard sort of version of Tourette's. It's not people just inappropriately yelling things, right? Um, so that also involves the, uh, the basal ganglia. Kind of fascinating. Oh, well, there we go. Next slide, right there. It's associated with Tourette's syndrome. There you go. Uh, and again, it involves uh, damage to the basal ganglia. 
we've got our obsessions and compulsions again the idea here is it has to get to the point where it's taking away time from other things right I'm not saying don't lock your doors lock your doors check to make sure they lock that's fine don't get in the car and then get back out and check and then get in the car and then get back out and check and then get in the car and get back out and you see now you're already 10 minutes late and you're not gonna make it to class right and so that's a disruption in your life I'm not going to ask you about this because it's, it's, it's sort of cool, but you know, there's some connection between some infections and developing OCD. No, this is not necessarily, um, uh, you know, it is a, a hemolytic streptococcal infection, um, and it, it does produce some ticks. Um, so when folks get these infections, sometimes they... Um, They'll develop some ticks. I'd say it's a little different. I don't know. Maybe you want to wear a mask. Maybe. I'd try that one. All right, we already talked about treatments. I'm not going to ask you about that. Uh, we could talk a little bit about autism spectrum disorder. Uh, this is sort of a, a developmental disorder. Typically, we think about sort of the, the standard hallmark here is difficulty with uh, social interactions, right? I think um, autism is, is one of these sort of complicated things because you could, you could meet two people and, and somebody says both of these people have been diagnosed with autism and they exhibit two completely different sets of behaviors. Uh, and it's, it's really, I think, a complicated issue. I don't think we, we understand fully what's going on neurologically yet, and I think that's why we're sort of, unfortunately, putting a lot of people in this same group right now. I think in, in, you know, maybe in a few years, we'll have some different diagnosis, right? We'll say, like, well, this is a group of people, different things are going on here uh, than in this other group of folks. Because you'll meet, um, when I was in graduate school, my neighbor had autism. Uh, and the only, like, so I'll just tell you this about him. I mean, and, and I would have told him this. He was a little bit annoying sometimes, and you had to tell him, like, hey, Jim, you need to go home. Uh, and Jim's like, okay, sorry, I know I'm annoying. I'm just going home. Uh, and he would, uh, he would just dig through your trash. That wasn't the annoying part. Uh, he would dig through your trash and pull out electronics, and then he would take those and, like, make, he made, uh, like, solar-powered Christmas lights, he took one of those hot dog cookers once. This was crazy. You know those things at the uh, gas station that cook hot dogs? He took one of those and pulled it apart and made some device to send shock waves, like, like electrical waves, through the dirt so that the worms would come up. And then he would, like, collect the worms and sell them to bait shops. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool. His, his entire He lived with his parents. He was, uh, he was probably in his late 20s, lived with his parents. He couldn't hold down a job. Uh, he tried a couple times. Uh, I think once he he went in a little inebriated, and, and that didn't go over well. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Jim was an interesting neighbor, and he. Uh, but his entire garage, like it was just full of like electronics and computer equipment. And he would just he would just like make things. He'd come over and ask you like, "Hey, you're throwing out that CD player there. Can I have that?" I was like, "Yeah, it doesn't work." He's like, "That's fine." So then he would I don't know turned into whatever, uh, which is completely different than somebody who has autism and, and can't communicate, right? Some folks are nonverbal and, and they, uh, and so you were, you, if you were to look at both of those and you were think, well, how are those two things similar, right? How are they similar? Um, one of the things that, you know, we talked about autism spectrum disorder and its involvement in, uh, uh, with basal ganglia and movement, one of the things that Jim would do and that you would see this a lot in folks uh, with autism spectrum disorder, he had some sort of uh, stereotypical movement, right? Anytime Jim would talk to you, he would rock back and forth the entire time, you know, that he was talking to you. He just kind of rocked back and forth. He just talked to you. wouldn't stand still the whole time. And so what you see with folks with autism, a lot of times they have some kind of stereotypical movement that they'll continue to make over and over again, right? And so that's, that's how it's connected to the basal ganglia. Let's see. Most of the time you see this in childhood. Um, 
computer froze. I think they send update. It happens every day in this class. There we go. So, uh, anyway, uh, sort of the, the, the broad overarching sort of thing that you want to look for here is, is going to be that um, sort of altered social interactions, right? Uh, de depending on where folks uh, are on the autism spectrum, they will have, um, you know, more mild or, or, or more significant um, difficulty communicating in social situations. And often, the you know, folks will, will know, uh, they'll know the rules of the interactions, but they you know, I, I've spoken to folks with, uh, you know, autism before, and if you don't, uh, you know, I was speaking to a guy a couple of years ago, and he said, you forgot to ask me how I feel today. I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I did forget to ask you how you feel today. You know, he's like, he pointed that out to me, and I was like, well, okay. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of violated the rules that he was expecting there. He said, how, how are you? I'm supposed to say, how, how are you today? I'm to, you know, kind of have that normal sort of thing. Um, so, so far, what we do know about Autism spectrum disorder seems to be pretty rapid um, neurological growth pretty early on, and then things slow down just a little bit. Uh, there seems to be some changes in the fusiform face area. That makes some sense. You know, one of the uh, sort of ways that we have social interactions is through identifying other faces and, and so forth. And so, you know, if that's not developing well, then that's kind of uh, interesting. There's that whole mirror neuron system, right? There are a number of folks who say, uh, well, folks with autism disorder, maybe their mirror neuron system's not working the same as, you know, folks who don't have autism spectrum disorder. You know, uh, it, that's been a little harder to, to sort of back up than some of the other things that have been going on. It does seem to be more likely in, in males than it is females. That was sort of the... Um, Baron Cohen here, and this is not the one that you see on television and movies. This is his brother, though. He's actually uh, uh, his brother. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah, so there you go, right? You just learned something today. Um, so he's, he's actually a neuroscientist. All right. Uh, we talked about this stuff. Uh, we could talk about ADHD a little bit. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. The main thing I want you to think about, because I think most folks have some idea about what's going on, is the um, sort of why do we treat uh, folks with ADHD with a stimulant, right? And the idea is that folks with ADHD, their prefrontal cortex is sort of taking a break, right? It's permanently on vacation. And so what you need to do is you need to activate that prefrontal cortex, get that working. That's that impulse control guy. You know, if it's uh, if it's out there and it's not doing what it's supposed to do, then you know people are just going to be, you know, randomly doing whatever jumps into their their minds. So, uh, so there you go. All right, questions about that before we move on to the next chapter. I know we're just flying through here, right? I want to get you out before eight o'clock tonight. You guys are my favorite Tuesday class this semester. I don't think you guys knew that, did you? Well, now you do. So I hope you feel better about yourselves. You see, I don't know if they know it. I only have one Tuesday class this semester. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we should talk a little bit about drug abuse, right? That's a thing. Uh, some of you can just take a nap through this if you want. Actually, all of you could take a nap through this if you wanted. Uh, but some of you have actually like taken another class I taught. It was an addiction studies course. We went over a lot of this, so it might be a review for those of you 
to do with that. But we'll go through this quickly. Hey, how about this? True or false? Most people who are exposed to drugs do not become addicted to them. That's pretty true, right? Um, you know, most people who, who take drugs, even, even, you know, things like heroin, right? Most people who take heroin don't become addicts. It's a minority of people that do. Doesn't mean we shouldn't spend some time figuring out what's going on and helping those folks. Hey, how many of you are drug users? No, but <laughs> I saw a lot of faces do this. <laughs> like a lot of people were like, don't look at me. Uh, this was, <laughs> I think there's like one small subset of you, and I don't think any of you fall in this category. You might, and if you do, I don't mean to marginalize you. Uh, but I, th I think all of you are going to fall into the drug user category. The only group of you that might not is if any of you are Mormons. Um, and Mormons don't, like, they don't ingest caffeine. And so that, you know, caffeine is a drug, uh, alcohol is a drug, tobacco, you know, nicotine is a drug. And that's before we even get to the things, you know, that you, you're, you're not currently allowed to buy, right, uh, in the state of West Virginia. Uh, and so, you know, before we jump into that threshold, I think most of you have used cocaine, or not cocaine, caffeine before. <laughs> few of you might have used cocaine. That's, that's your business, not mine. Uh, kind of an odd time to raise your hand. Uh, <laughs> just letting you know. Uh, and other drugs too, right? I mean, we're thinking about like psychoactive drugs, but there are other drugs out there. Tylenol, you guys, you know, how many of you have taken, you know, pain medication? Even an Advil, right? I mean, that's, there you go, right? I mean, that's, uh, that's a drug. Any, any kind of chemical substance you're going to put in your body, uh, that your body did not make, that's coming from the outside world, that's a drug, right? That's some exogenous substance. Uh, there you go. So, uh, we should think about, uh, you know, drug addiction. Some people say substance abuse instead of addiction. Um, you know, the terminology, I, I think, might matter to the person it's directed to, right? I don't know that it changes the um, definition or the, the concept any. For me, I actually kind of like the word addiction better uh, than substance abuse because I take a little bit of a broader definition of this uh, than some folks, right? And so for our purposes, we're going to be thinking about, uh, you know, substance abuse, you know, and, and then they'll even put alcohol separately, right? How many of you are familiar with the, the DSM-5? Is it a 5? Yeah, it's, it's actually substance abuse and alcohol use disorder, right? They're two different things. Substance abuse disorder, substance use disorder, that's it. And then alcohol use disorder. They're two separate things. And then there's a third category for only one thing, and that's a behavioral addiction. That's gambling, right? So that's kind of like this third thing. Um, you know, from the brain's perspective, just about anything can be addictive. Um, there's a certain brain, uh, set of brain structures we'll talk about in a moment that have to get activated. As long as they're activated, the brain thinks it's addiction. Doesn't matter what it is, right? And that can be a substance, or that can be an activity, right? It can be uh, gambling, right? Gambling's fine. It can be cocaine. Cocaine fits this category. It can be, in fact, it can be the the ritual you take to inject heroin that might actually be uh, activating those brain regions, right? So it may even be the the, the behavior you're doing not the substance itself, even though a substance is involved. And the substance is going to do something as well, but the behaviors um, can also be involved there. So a lot of folks will take this medical model approach. That's much better than the, the what they used to call the willpower model, right, Cameron? It was just like, you're a bad person because you're a drug addict, and I'm sorry. Uh, and that was really not good, right? And so I was like, oh, I feel horrible about that. You know, I'm just, I'm just no good, right? I'm just an alcoholic, bad people. Um, we moved past that to this medical model. It's very practical because it gets you access to insurance that will cover treatments. That's awesome. Describing what's going on in your brain, it doesn't really do much. It's like, oh, you've got a diseased brain and you're addicted to heroin now. It's like, well, no, not really. Uh, your brain's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to find activities that increase dopamine. When that activity increases dopamine, you want to repeat it because dopamine makes you feel good. Now, typically things that increase dopamine are like taking care of your kids, finding good food sources, uh, personal hygiene, uh, hanging out with friends and family, exercising, right? These are things that increase dopamine. 
If you happen to luck onto something that increases dopamine more than that, and it's cocaine, well, man, your brain's just going to go with it, right? It doesn't know. It just knows I do A, and dopamine goes up. So I'm going to keep doing A. It's that simple, right? Whatever that activity is, it's not really a, um, it's not really a big deal. So I like to think about it from more of an evolutionary perspective, right? Your brain has evolved to find the activity that increases dopamine the most with the least amount of effort, right? And there's some sort of what we call a break point with drugs. So caffeine will increase dopamine levels, right? What would you go through to get caffeine, right? Like how much effort if you're, if you're really craving caffeine? Like, well, you know, you might walk over to the student center, right, and go to Starbucks. Okay, and that's probably the extent of it, right? You're not going to do much more than that. If it takes much more effort than that, Andre, you're like, Dad, forget it, right? Now, if you're addicted to cocaine, you're going to do a lot more than just walk across campus to the student center, right, and lay down like $8 for a cup of coffee or whatever they charge you. I don't even know how much it is. I don't drink coffee, and I've been into Starbucks like four times, and it was always to get something for my wife, and so I was like, well, whatever. It's a little marshmallow treats, the one here on campus. Anyway. So, uh, so you'll do a lot more because the payoff's more, right? The dopamine spike you get from cocaine is much more than caffeine, right? And so you're willing to put a little more work into it. So I think that's a better approach approach for me when we're describing the phenomenon. Now, in terms of like helping people who are in treatment, right now it's all that biopsychosocial business, right? So they're looking at the biological aspect. I think that's awesome. They're looking at some psychological and some social components. I think that's great too. And I think for a treatment and prevention perspective, that makes some sense. In terms of describing what's actually going on, though, I don't know that some of those other components are as helpful. But that's my take on it. I know, right, Casey? You can tell everybody I said that. They know what I think. Yeah. How many of you were at the big uh, Let's Talk About Opioids at Fat Patties a few weeks ago? Nobody was there? That's exactly what it was called. Let's Talk About Opioids at Fat Patties. What was it called, Casey? Heard Around Town. <laughs> That's what it was called. It was called Heard Around Town, and some folks from the psych department, including me, uh, were there, and we talked about opioids, and somebody asked that question, and I gave a different answer than somebody else from the psych department gave, but... There you go. Not saying their answer was wrong, just wasn't right. Just kidding. Huh? Yeah. I think they were focusing more on the, the practical aspect. I was focusing more on the like understanding the mechanism aspect. So there you go. Uh, so let's talk about addiction or substance use disorder or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's all going to shake out to be about the same, right? Definitely you're going to crave this substance. Um, you might even try to stop using it, but a lot of your time, when you know it's become a problem is when a lot of your time is spent seeking and acquiring the substance prevents you from doing other things, right? This is why we never talk about someone having a caffeine addiction, right? Because, I mean, again, how much of your time is lost walking over to the student center and getting a cup of coffee? None, right? It's a perfectly normal thing. You probably took your friends with you, right? So it's not something where we think about that's disrupting your life. Somebody who has a cocaine addiction, on the other hand, and you start engaging in illegal activities. You start taking risky behaviors. You start doing things that are detrimental to you, uh, and you start sacrificing that time that you should be spent that should be spent on other activities. And then that's when we say, okay, you got a problem, right? Uh, all drug use is not problematic, right? It only becomes prob problematic when you're uh, causing harm to yourself or you're pulling yourself out of those normal daily activities, right? Here's a whole list of drugs that uh, are, are commonly abused, right? Uh, I don't know. Some of these maybe uh, don't belong on this list. I think you could make a strong argument that uh, marijuana should not be on the list of abused drugs. Uh, and, and one reason I say that is because all of these other drugs that are on this list, um, there's some weird stories here, but let's say all the rest of these drugs uh, do a great job of jacking up your dopamine levels, right? Okay. 
And that dopamine level in that sort of that mesolimbic pathway, that mesocortical pathway, that's that reward pathway, right, that drives this behavior. Uh, marijuana doesn't really seem to do that in the same way, right? It doesn't really seem to have that same activity. Another group of drugs that are typically on the, like, don't touch that list are, are things like LSD, right? LSD, uh, psilocybin, right? These drugs are typically drugs people think of, like, oh, those are bad drugs. They also don't increase dopamine levels. They work on the serotonergic system. They do a completely different thing. So they're not addictive, right? And so they're not, if you're not jacking up those dopamine levels, it's not something that's going to cause that to be an addictive behavior or an addictive substance, right? So I think putting those in a different category makes a lot of sense. Saying that, that, that marijuana can be abused, I don't know. That's something you could have an honest debate about, I think. And perhaps not even included on that list. Again, drugs have reinforcing effects, right? We can talk about that. The main thing you want to think about when you take a drug, when you do a behavior that is addictive, right? That's going to be something you want to repeat. It's going to increase the release of dopamine by the ventral tegmental area onto the nucleus accumbens. And that's it right there. The VTA to the nucleus accumbens, that's the story. If you're doing something addictive, you'll see a massive spike of dopamine dumped on the nucleus accumbens. It's that simple. When you take cocaine, methamphetamine, massive dump of dopamine on the nucleus accumbens. When you get an A on your final exam, decent amount of dopamine on the nucleus accumbens. You're not getting a massive dump, right? You could. Well, you could get yourself addicted to studying. You ever think about that? Casey, like, what are all the things you're really addicted to but you don't realize you're addicted to them because they're not causing a quote-unquote disruption in your daily life? How many of you are addicted to taking showers? How many of you take, you don't have to answer this. How many of you take a shower at least, like, once or twice a day? Yeah, right? I mean, it's like most people, right? I'm glad, like, like the, there are some people like, I'm not taking a chance on this. I'm raising my hand anyway. Uh, I know he said not to, but I am raising my hand. I'm going to raise it all the way up, let you know I even wear deodorant. Uh, both hands up. Uh, I mean, I guess you could become so addicted to taking showers it's disruptive, right? But, I mean, if I were, you know, so I take a shower a couple times a day, right? Maybe three times, depending on what I'm doing, right? Joel, and that's not unreasonable. You go to the gym maybe in the morning, right? You got something to do in the evening, right? You know, there are two or three times you could probably take a shower a day, right? That's reasonable. Um, if I'm shooting up cocaine two or three times a day, though, I mean, I've got a problem, right? I, I think the activity is important, right? It makes a difference. So there you go. Um, definitely we're going to increase the release of dopamine on the nucleus accumbens. It's going to have that pleasurable, uh, pleasurable effect, right? And then it, uh, it develops into some sort of habit. We could talk about how that works. What I really want you to think about and get out of this is nucleus accumbens is getting a massive amount of dump, dopamine dumped on it from the ventral tegmental area. see if there's anything else that's important. I think there are other classes that would talk to you about why people use drugs. That's a whole different set of questions, right? Like, why do people use drugs? And that's a question, um, in fact, you know, Zane, you're a Phi Alpha Theta, uh, right? Isn't that what it is? Yeah, you're... Let's go with that. Uh, you know, I mean, if we were to ask history, right? I mean, like, how long have people been using drugs? Since there have been people, yeah. right? Since there have been people, they've been using drugs. And probably even before there were people, something was using drugs, right? You can ask the people over in the anthropology department. They'll tell you. Uh, drug use is, is pervasive in all cultures, right? And there are drugs that are used um, without problems, and then there are drugs that are used with problems, right? Uh, and this happens in a lot of cultures. It's not just ours. Um, it's, it's been a historical problem. It's a species problem. We've got a brain that evolved to, to do activities that increase dopamine. And if we happen to, in our experience, luck upon an activity that, again, increases dopamine in a massive way, we're just going to keep doing it. So there you go. Uh, let's see. We don't need to talk about that too much. Skip this. Negative reinforcement. Don't worry about that too much. 
craving. This is actually something that I think is important. It's kind of an interesting thing. It kind of goes back to that learning and memory model that we talked about with extinction and the reinstatement of behaviors, right? So I think this is, this is a problem for folks uh, who have been on drugs for a long time and then they go into some sort of treatment, right? And let's say they're clean for a number of years and then they relapse, right? All of a sudden they find themselves in some sort of situation that reminds them of one of their previous drug use situations and they'll often um, kind of lapse back into that drug use activity and they'll relapse. Why this is a problem, this wouldn't be such a problem if, um, if, if people were prepared for that, right? And I think you should be. I think if you or someone you know has dealt with addiction, you should know, I've not forgotten those behaviors, I've not forgotten that association, right? And at any moment, if I get in the right setting, I can trigger that behavior again. So you gotta watch out for that. But also, I think what happens to a lot of folks, we see folks who have been clean for an extended period of time, and then they suddenly have a massive overdose, right? And the reason for that is uh, tolerance, right? While they were on drugs for whatever time period that was, they developed tolerance to that drug, right? And so they're taking, you know, so if you start a drug and you start down here with a low dose, and then over time, you have to increase the dose, right, to have uh, that same desired effect. And then you stop taking the drug and you're clean, and you go back and you're like, wow, last time I used drugs, I was using, you know, five milligrams or whatever. I don't know what it is. Uh, and you go back and you use that same dose, you're not prepared for that physiologically, right? Those tolerance mechanisms have dissipated and you hit that massive dose again, your body can't handle that. Um, and that's why you would see those folks have overdoses uh, often if they've been off drugs for a while and they try to, or they get in a situation where they go back and, and relapse. So that's my relapse story. And relapses happen. I think that's the other thing. Like don't expect you're gonna stop using drugs and you're just going to be clean the rest of your life, right? I mean, relapses happen. It's perfectly normal, right? It's perfectly neurological. Your brain is set up to relapse, right? Because you want to keep that relationship stored there somewhere because you never know when that's going to be true again, right? It's the same thing with the, the ring the bell and you get shocked, right? You never know when ringing a bell and getting shocked is going to be true again, so you can't get rid of that. It's the same thing with addiction. You're not going to get rid of that, okay? So I think if you were... Um, I think everyone would benefit if they realized that. Because uh, I think sometimes folks get frustrated with their family members when they have a relapse. Get frustrated with yourself if you have a relapse, right? If you've tried to uh, stop using a drug. Now, this is not me telling you, like, if you're using drugs, just keep using them. Don't try, you know, forget trying to stop. That's a waste of your time. No, you're saying be prepared for those times when you are going to have relapses because I think that will help you. You know, if you're prepared for that, if you know, like, hey, I'm clean now, uh, but I could go back to that, that pattern is still stored in my brain, I need to be ready for that. I think it really gives you some, some strength, right? And I think that's another reason to move away from the medical model. Uh, you guys don't have to answer this, but if you know someone who, who has been uh, dealing with addiction, if you ask them, like, you know, or talk to them about being sick, they'll tell you, no, I don't feel sick. I'm not sick, right? There's nothing wrong with me. Uh, they'll often tell you that, you know, describing them as a person with an illness doesn't really fit. Right? So it doesn't really work for them. And so um, some other approach might make more sense. So that's why I like the medical model. Or I mean the, uh, like a biological approach. I mean, I mean, if somebody's got high cholesterol, I mean, we don't really have a lot of stigma attached to that, right? What do you do? You take a pill, you diet, you exercise, right? Somebody's got addiction, what do you do? You go through treatment, you try to structure your life so you're not going to be in those situations, right? I think about it in the same way. Uh, there is some evidence that social uh, stress will, will increase drug use, right? Um, that doesn't necessarily make you more likely to become a drug addict. It just increases the likelihood that you would seek out and use drugs, right? Da -da -da -da. We can skip through this. Alcohol metabolism. Opiates. Uh, we could hit on each of these a little bit. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Main problem with opiates is, uh, or with any drug that's injected, right, are, are sort of the secondary effects, right? So you're dealing with uh, some of those secondary health effects because uh, folks are sharing needles, you're using things that aren't clean um, because of that. The other problem is, um, so, I mean, if I'm going to go buy heroin, 
I don't know, I'm not asking you to tell me where to go buy heroin so you don't have to like chip in on that. But I'm not I'm not I'm not going down to the local like heroin store, right, where the guy's like measuring out the concentration of heroin and you know, he's got like beakers and flasks and knows how to use them. Uh right, and he can like measure things and I know like when I'm buying this heroin I'm getting this certain strength and it's only heroin, right? Uh, when I'm buying heroin off the street, I'm getting something someone's telling me is heroin. Uh, but who knows what else is in there, right? They're just kind of like, well, I got some of this, and I need a little more heroin, so there you go. Have at it. Go sell it, you know? And so you don't know what's in there all the time. And some of those secondary substances are ones that are really dangerous. If you don't know what they are, when you mix them with other things, it can cause some serious problems. So there you go. It's different. I told a group the other day, back when I used to buy drugs, uh, and then I, I, I should have said, like, for my lab, I used to buy drugs. Uh, I worked in a lab where we gave rats um, ecstasy. We gave them LSD, cocaine. Uh, we gave them a number of drugs. But we always got them in these little vials, and they came from a scientific supply company, and it was all, like, certified, and I knew... Like, what is the strength of my cocaine that I have here? And I know it's only cocaine, right? There's, like, nothing else cut in there. And so I know when I give that to that rat, it's like, that's 100%. I know exactly what it is. Uh, but when you go over on whatever avenue you go on that has some number on it um, and, and try to make a purchase, you don't know what the quality of that is, right? You don't know the purity of that. It can cause some problems. So that was my story there. The other thing I want to tell you about drugs, this is kind of important, uh, because there's this word endogenous, right? If you can take a drug and it does something to you, you make something very similar to it inside your body already, or you wouldn't have a receptor for it, right? So you already have endogenous opioids, right, that are released when you experience pain. So you have some substance similar to heroin, similar to morphine, similar to these drugs that actually work. You have a substance similar to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, cannabis, right? So you have these cannab cannabinoid receptors, right? Because you create uh, cannabinoids inside your body, endogenous cannabinoids as well. Let's see. Let's see if there's anything else I want you guys to know that we haven't already talked about. There are therapies, um, you know, for opiates, typically what we will give someone, if somebody's addicted to heroin, we'll give them something just a bit weaker than heroin, right? To try to prevent them from having those relapses and cravings and also to prevent them from having um, going through withdrawal. I don't know if anybody's ever been through withdrawal, seen someone who's gone through withdrawal. It's not a fun time, right? And for some drugs, it can actually be life-threatening, uh, alcohol being one of those, right? If you're a severe alcoholic and then you go, like, okay, I'm going to try to quit alcohol, don't do that at home by yourself, right? Uh, that, can, that can cause seizures, it can cause death, it can be a real problem. You need to have some medical professionals help you with that. And it's called, uh, you know, MAT. It's a, um, you know, it's medically assisted uh, treatment, right? And so you have these drugs that folks will give you, these, you know, that will help alleviate those withdrawal symptoms, so you're not going to get into some sort of, some sort of issue. And the reason with alcohol that you, uh, that you have the um, um, seizures is because alcohol is a, uh, it's a depressant of your central nervous system, right? So it's kind of got everything pulled down. You're working really hard to, to fight against that homeostasis, right? And when you remove all that inhibition, your tolerance has jacked things up really high, right? So your cells, your brain cells are going to be overactive and can uh, send you into seizures. That is a serious, a serious issue. All right. I think that's the extent of what I'd like to talk about on drug abuse. Does anybody have any questions? <clears throat> 